Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me on this intimate jaunt into the dictionary. We are on the last quarter of page 62, so let's do it. Aqua tint. That's our first word. A Q U A T I N T. This is a noun from 1782, a method of etching a printing plate so that tones similar to watercolor washes can be reproduced. Also, a print made from a plate so etched. Aquatint is a transitive verb. Aquatinter is a noun and a funny word to say, but not as funny as aquatintist, which is also a noun. This is Italian from aquatinta, and it means dyed water. Next, we have aquavit. V-I-T is the end of that word. This is a noun from 1864, a clear Scandinavian liquor flavored with caraway seeds. It looks like this is from Swedish and Danish and Norwegian. Akvavit, A-Q-V-A-V-I-T, uh, which is from the Middle Latin aqua vitae. Which is our next word? Aqua vitae, two separate words. This is a noun from the 15th century, a strong alcoholic liquor as brandy. This is uh, Middle Latin, literally means water of life. Next we have aqueduct. This is a noun from 1538. 1a, a conduit for water, especially one for carrying a large quantity of flowing water. 1b, a structure for conveying a canal over a river or hollow. 2. A canal or passage in a part or organ. This is Latin from aqua ductus, which is from aquae, uh, plus ductus, which means act of leading, and there's more at the word duct. Next we have aqueous. Ah, I think I said that a couple episodes ago. I think I said aqueous. It's aqueous. This is an adjective from 1646. 1a, one, of relating to or resembling water. 1b, made from, with, or by water, as in an aqueous solution. 2, of or relating to the aqueous humor. What's the aqueous humor? Are those just jokes that fish tell? Oh, here's aqueous humor. It's our next word. It's a noun from 1638, a transparent fluid occupying the space between the crystalline lens and the cornea of the eye. Ooh, it's inside the eyeball. Next we have aquifer. This is a noun from 1897, a water-bearing stratum of permeable rock, sand, or gravel. Aquiferous is an adjective. Next we have aquila. A-Q-U-I-L-A, with a capital A at the beginning. This is a noun from the 14th century, a constellation in the northern hemisphere represented by the figure of an eagle. And in Latin, aquila literally means eagle. Next we have aquilegia, all one word. A-Q-U-I-L-E-G-I-A. It's a noun from 1706, and it has a synonym which is columbine. Next, we have aquiline. This is an adjective from 1646. One, curving like an eagle's beak, as in an aquiline nose. If I saw this word in the wild, I would have assumed it was uh, water-related. Uh, but now that I know that um, aquila, A-Q-U-I-L-A, is, uh, literally means eagle, uh, now I know that a word starting with this is related to an eagle. Number two of relating to or resembling an eagle. Aquilinity is a noun. Next we have a quiver, A-Q-U-I-V-E-R. This is an adjective from 1864, marked by trembling or quivering. Now we have R, A-R. It's the first form. It's a noun from the 15th century, and the definition just says the letter R. Yep, that's what it is. That's how you say it. All right, here we have the second form of R. It's an abbreviation for arrival or arrive. Now we have R again, but the A is capitalized. This is the first form of two. It's an abbreviation for the word Arabic. Here we go with the second form of R with a capital A. It's a symbol for the word argon. That's one of the elements. 
Go check out the periodic table. Learn it. Know it. Love it. We have R one more time, but in this case, both letters are capitalized. It is an abbreviation for eight things. Probably more, but the dictionary only gives us eight. One, accounts receivable. Two, acknowledgement of receipt. Three, all rail. Four, all risks. Five, annual return. Six, Arkansas, or as I like to sometimes say, Arkansas. Seven, army regulation. And eight, autonomous republic. And I guess we technically have one more case of R. It's a suffix spelled still A-R. Uh, and it means of or relating to. That's the whole definition, of or relating to. As in molecular. Really, it's molecular. I'm just emphasizing it. It could also mean being, as in spectacular. Could also mean resembling, as in oracular. That's a weird one. O-R-A-C-U-L-A-R. So I guess of or relating to wasn't the entire definition, but it was one of the definitions. I assumed it was going to go on because so many of these definitions actually start with of or relating to. So I thought there would be more. All right, next we have the word Arab, capital A-R-A-B. It's the first form. This is a noun from the 14th century. 1A, a member of the Semitic people of the Arabian Peninsula. 1B, a member of the Arabic-speaking people. 2, synonym is Arabian horse. Arab is also an adjective. The etymology says this is from the Latin Arabus or Arabs, which is from the Greek Arab or Araps of Semitic origin akin to uh, the Akkadian Arabu or Arabi, uh, which is uh, desert nomads, or the Arabic, which is what we're talking about, the Arabic word um, Arab, which I think it means Bedouins. I don't know how to pronounce that word. B-E-D-O-U-I-N-S. The B is capitalized. Now we have the second form of Arab. It is an abbreviation for Arabian or Arabic. Next we have Arabesque. A-R-A-B-E-S-Q-U-E. This is the first form. This is an adjective from circa 1656 of relating to or being in the style of Arabesque or an Arabesque. This is French from the Italian arabesco, which is uh, Arabian in fashion. And now we have the second form of arabesque. It is a noun from circa 1720. One, an ornament or style that employs flower, foliage, or fruit, and sometimes animal and figural outlines to produce an intricate pattern of interlaced lines. Two, a posture, as in ballet, in which the body is bent forward from the hip on one leg with one arm extended forward and the other arm and leg backward. Sounds like a game of twister. Three, an elaborate or intricate pattern. There is a little black and white picture of the first definition of this uh, set of definitions, the second form of arabesque. Um, it's hard to describe, but their definition was pretty good. There's a lot of interweaving lines. It's a little intricate and ornamental. Uh, and maybe I will post a picture of either this one or a different example. Now we have the first form of Arabian. It is a noun from the 14th century. The uh, first A is capitalized, by the way. One, a native or inhabitant of Arabia. Two, synonym is Arabian horse. Now we have the second form of Arabian. It's an adjective from the 14th century. And we have the first definition of the word Arabic, which will be the first word of the next episode. And lastly, to end this episode, we have Arabian horse. Two separate words. The first A is capitalized. This is a noun from 1588. Any of an ancient breed of swift, compact horses developed in Arabia and usually having gray or chestnut silky hair. I am going to pick aquiline as the word of the episode because 
I had never heard it before, and I had no idea, obviously, that it was related to uh, eagles, uh, something resembling an eagle. I will try and remember that for the future. That's the end of the episode. I'm Spencer. I'm reading you this book called The Dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. As you regular listeners know, sometimes I talk a little bit about my personal life, Um, and I was just a few days ago in Los Angeles. I was there to, uh, well, I'll talk about that in the next episode, Um, but I will tell you what I did the first night, Friday night. Robot Chicken had their 10th season premiere show um, where they played some clips from old episodes, they interviewed some people, and they also played the entire first episode of the 10th season. So I just wanted to give you a few highlights uh, from the night because I had a blast. Um, It was at the Ace Hotel in downtown L.A. Seth Green and Matthew Senreich, who are the creators of the show, they were, of course, there through the whole time. Um, The MC for the night was none other than Will Wheaton. Of course, he is known mostly from uh, Stand By Me and uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, but he's done a lot of things, and uh, he kind of encapsulates uh, the epitome of nerd culture. I don't mean that in a mean way at all. Uh, That's actually a term of endearment. I think he would take that as a compliment, which is how it's meant. Uh, So yeah, they brought out some of the original writers, uh, interviewed them, played some of their classic clips. Uh, Then they brought out some writers and directors from the current season, the new 10th season, which just started on Sunday, I think, September 30th? Was that Sunday? Anyway, uh, and one of them was Brecken Meyer, who's been a longtime guest star on Robot Chicken. He's very good friends with uh, Matt and Seth, and he is a goofy guy. He was wearing a jumpsuit. He talked about... um, his Boba Fett underwear, which, uh, of course, Seth Green didn't believe that he was wearing, so he actually showed us all his Boba Fett underwear. Uh, Seth Green had a, uh, a t-shirt cannon. They had special uh, 10th season robot chicken shirts that they were shooting out to people, uh, which he passed off to all the various guests who came up, uh, and Brecken Meyer had a good time with that as well. A little bit more on the t-shirt cannon later. Uh, then they brought out some of uh, their guest voice actors, which included uh, one of the guys from Fall Out Boy. Um, he's done some music for them. Felicia Day, uh, Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar Binks, and um, none other than Weird Al. None of them were announced beforehand. Uh, it was truly an honor to see them, especially Weird Al, especially because uh, the next day I would be recording some episodes of talking about Weird Al music, so that was pretty interesting. And at the end of the show, they had all the actors uh, perform sketches that uh, were never were never made, were never created. They were ideas that they had that were got written and that they got axed, uh, and so that was kind of fun to see. And for the very last sketch, they brought out a new special guest who was none other than Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone and many other things, of course. Uh, and the the additional funny thing, it was very cool to see him, but the additional funny thing about that was just that that was the third Home Alone reference of the day for me. Uh, so that was very strange. Uh, and then real quick about the t-shirt cannon. Um, at one point near the end of the night, I think it was Ahmed Best who had the t-shirt cannon. He shot it up. I was in the balcony along with the other general admission people, and it came right for me. I was not quite prepared. I should have put my hands up. Uh, but I was with it enough to move my head to the side. Uh, if I hadn't, it literally would have hit me square in the face. It did graze my neck. Uh, it hit the leg of the woman behind me. And then like the six or seven of us in that area started scrambling, looking for it. And it just disappeared. We just could not find this t-shirt anywhere. Uh, but they did give out free t-shirts at the end. They had a, a table set up and they were giving them out. And then as I was leaving the show, walking to my lift... I saw none other than Tazon Day of Chocolate Rain fame, and I quickly said hi, and I got a picture with him, so that was very weird and cool. But let's get to the words. That took up a good few minutes. All right, the first word for this episode is Arabic, capital A-R-A-B-I-C. This is the first form. It's a noun from the 14th century, a Semitic language originally of the Arabs, of the Hejaz and Nejd 
that is now the prevailing speech of a wide region of southwestern Asia and northern Africa. Apologies if I mispronounced any of those words, specifically Hejaz is spelled H-E-J-A-Z, and Nejd is N-E-J-D. I'm sure I pronounced them incorrectly. Next, we have the second form of Arabic. This is an adjective from the 14th century. One, of, relating to, or characteristic of Arabia or the Arabs. Two, of, relating to, or constituting Arabic. Three, expressed in or utilizing Arabic numerals. Next, we have Arabica. This is a noun from 1882. One, an evergreen shrub or tree yielding seeds that produce a high-quality coffee and form a large portion of the coffee of commerce. Two, the seeds of Arabica, especially roasted and often ground. The scientific name for the evergreen shrub or tree is Coffea Arabica. Next, we have Arabic alphabet. Two words, the first A in Arabic is capitalized. This is a noun from 1732. An alphabet of 28 letters derived from the Aramaic alphabet, which is used for writing Arabic and also with adaptations for other languages of the Islamic world. Next, we have Arabicize. A-R-A-B-I-C-I-Z-E. This is a transitive verb from 1826. One, to adapt a language or elements of a language to the phonetic or structural pattern of Arabic. Two, we have the number one definition for Arabize, which we will be getting to in the future. Arabicization is a noun. Now we have Arabic numeral, two separate words. This is a noun from 1756, any of the number symbols. And then it shows me the symbols, which are zero through nine. And then it tells me to see the number table. Next, we have Arabinose, A-R-A-B-I-N-O-S-E. This is a noun from 1889, a white crystalline aldose sugar, C5H10O5, occurring especially in vegetable gums. Next, we have Arabinoside, A-R-A-B-I-N-O-S-I-D-E. This is a noun from 1927, a glycoside that yields arabinose on hydrolysis. Lots of fun words. By the way, if uh, this sounds a little bit different, that is because of a couple of reasons. First, I am not recording in the normal audio booth that I normally do. Um, and second, it is because I have a, uh, a foam piece on the microphone, which I should have been using this whole time. I don't know why I didn't, um, but I think that changes the sound a little bit. And here we go with Arabize, A-R-A-B-I-S-E. This is the British variation of Arabize with a Z-E. And the American spelling with a Z is the one that I mentioned previously that we will be getting to in the future. Next, we have Arabism with a capital A. This is a noun from 1614. One, a characteristic feature of Arabic occurring in another language. Two, devotion to Arab interests, culture, aspirations, or ideals. Next, we have Arabist, with a capital A. This is a noun from 1753. One, a specialist in the Arabic language or in Arabic culture. Two, a person who favors Arab interests and positions in international affairs. And here we go with Arabize, with a capital A. This is a transitive verb from 1883. One, A, to cause to acquire Arabic customs, manners, speech, or outlook. 1b. To modify a population by intermarriage with Arabs. 2. We have the one definition for Arabicize, which is that one that we read earlier. And Arabization is a noun. Next is Arable. A-R-A-B-L-E. It's the first form. This is an adjective from the 15th century. 1. Fit for or used for the growing of crops. Two is British. Engaged in, produced by, or being the cultivation of arable land. Arability is a noun. The etymology says this is from the Latin arabilis, which is from the verb arare, which means to plow, and that is akin to the Old English 
arion, which means to plow, and the Greek arun, A-R-O-U-N. Now we have the second form of arable. This is a noun from 1576. It is chiefly British, and it means land fit or used for the growing of crops. Also, a plot of such land, as in the village arable of Anglo-Saxon times. And we will do one more for this episode. It is Arab Spring. Two separate words, first letters of each are capitalized. This is a noun from 2010, uh, and that uh, I'm pretty sure might be the most recent one I've seen in this book. By the way, I am using a physical book. It is a little on the old side, so there are probably a lot of words that have been added uh, that are not in here. So I might need to figure out uh, if I need to do an update. So the definition is, a series of anti-government uprisings affecting Arab countries of North Africa and the Middle East beginning in 2010. I am going to pick Arabic numeral as the word of the episode, I guess it's two words, uh, because those numbers, 0 through 9, are the base for math in our world. There are other languages that have different symbols for those numbers. Uh, But, you know, I speak English. The majority of the world speaks English. I think the majority of the world recognizes those symbols, uh, and they are really important. Math and science and numbers are hugely important to this world. So that is the word of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds, and welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This one is special because I have a guest reader. I bet you thought that I wasn't going to get any more. But I found one. I found a willing victim. His name is Mark, and he is my brother-in-law. Say hi, Mark. Hey, hi. Hi. Are you ready to do this most ridiculous thing in the world? Uh, I think I am, though I have no idea how to pronounce this next word. We could give it a shot. I guess the pronunciation should be right there next to the word. This is the dictionary, after all. Yes, and I can help you. Okay. Ara. Man. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Arach. Arach. Arachidonic acid. That's it. Yep. It is a noun. It's from 1913. Uh, it sounds like a 1913 word. Uh, a, a liquid, unsaturated fatty acid, C20, H3202, that occurs in most animal fats and is a precursor of prostaglandins and is considered essential in animal nutrition. So I guess the more of that you have, the more nutritious the animal. Uh, the next word? Are we going on to the next word? Yes? Sure. Okay. Oh, actually, I, I just want to say that yes. that weird word uh, in the last one was, yeah, prostaglandin, P-R-O-S-T-A-G-L-A-N-D-I-N-S. I don't know what that is. Yeah. It sounds yummy, though, right? Very tasty. And very nutritious. Okay. Our next word is, uh, oh boy, uh, arcus oil? Uh, I think it's arachis. Hmm. Okay. Arachis. Or, uh, arachis. Arachis. Okay. It is a noun. Uh, and it's from 1811, so this is going way back. It is a synonym for peanut oil. Yeah, and uh, the etymology says this is uh, New Latin arachis, uh, A-R-A-C-H-I-S, and it's a genus that includes the peanut, uh, and it is from the Greek arachis, which is a diminutive of arachos, which is a legume. Hmm. This is fascinating. So uh, our next word is, uh, well... It's a prefix. What's a pre- oh, this is a prefix? We're doing a prefix? Arachin. Arachin or arachno. Yeah. Now I'm kind of getting the willies because this is sounding, sounding like spiders at this point. Well, you just wait. Okay. So this one is, uh, what, what is, uh, is it, have, what is a pre, a, what, how do you, this is not a noun or a verb or what is it? No, it's a, it, it, it says combined form. I usually just skip that part, but the, the definition is just uh, means spider or arachnid. Yeah. Spider web is in there because what? That's of spiders? Right. Basically, yeah. The, the prefix arachn or arachno basically means it's a spider. Mm. So this is an example okay. in these uh, angled brackets as in arachnology. Which would be the study. I, I guess. guess. Yeah, study yeah, yeah. of spiders. Okay. And the etymology says this is from the Greek arachne, which means spider or spider web. Uh, yeah, perhaps akin to the Latin arania, which means spider. And the Greek arcus, which means net. Mm. And now we get into the good part. Okay, so the arachnid. That is is our next word. Sure, it's a noun from 1826. 
and you have a class of arthropods. Wow, arthropods. This is good. Compromising chiefly terrestrial invertebrates, including the spiders, scorpions, mites, and ticks, and having a segmented body divided into two regions of which the anterior bears four pairs of legs, but no antennae. Ooh, not like ants. Not like ants. Separate, yes. Uh, And the class mentioned at the beginning is Arachnida, uh, uh, A-R-A-C-H-N-I-D-A. Okay. Uh, And moving on to uh, Arachnoid. Yep, Which? and that little one means this is the first form oh, okay, of first three. Sure. So in this, this one's an adjective, the next one's a noun, and the next one is also an adjective. But we will start with the first form of arachnoid. Adjective, 1789. Now I'm going to tell you, at 51 years of age, uh, the print size in the dictionary uh, seems almost impossible to read. Well, uh, I shrunk this page just so you would have a hard, a hard time. time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the other, th- okay, so, okay, here we go. So 1789, uh, one, uh, of or relating to a thin membrane of the brain and spinal cord that lies between the dura matter and the pia matter. Yeah, dura, uh, D-U-R-A, and I don't know if it's matter or mater or mater. Right, it could One be of ma- those. mater. Yeah, it could be mater. Sure, pia mater. I like that. It's like pia zadora. So that's good. That's always good. So two, uh, covered with or composed of soft, loose hairs or fibers. Okay. Yeah, so arachnoid in this case has nothing to do with spiders. Mm-mm, just webs. Looks like webs, maybe. I guess, yeah, webs. thin membranes. Yeah, thin membranes. Uh, two, arachnoid. This is uh, the same. Uh, this second will be form. The, the second form. Noun version, 1804, an arachnoid membrane. That's the definition. Hmm. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it, that, that, that's kind of a stupid definition, but they, they, they exist. Sure, so it seems like you could just get away with two, but there's actually three. Like, you could take that one out and just have the other. Yeah, of course, it, this is censorship at the, this point, and I guess that's not up to us, is it? No. No. Okay. Uh, Ragnoid uh, form three is an adjective from 1825, uh, resembling or related to the arachnids. So this one is spider related. Yeah, that one seems right. Uh, so we sh- can move on to an arachnologist, which I guess you could probably guess is a person who specializes in the study of spiders and other uh arachnids uh, it's a noun and it uh, came to us uh, in the year 1816 so apparently people before 1816 who studied spiders were called something else no there just were no people who studied spiders back oh. then yeah they just so, didn't exist okay. nobody cared fantastic um we have a couple forms this uh let's see arachnolog oh boy this is a hard one mm-hmm. arachnological mm-hmm. is an adjective and uh arachnology is a noun mm-hmm so now we're into arachnophobia. Yep. Okay, so it's uh, modern psychological evaluations of humans, uh, which I guess started in 1863. I don't know when Freud was uh, in fashion. But arachnophobia, uh, does anyone want to take a guess at what that might mean? Pathological fear or loathing of spiders? If you said that, that would be correct. You win. Mm-hmm. Arachnophobe is a noun, and uh, arachnophobic is an adjective or a noun. Right. Okay. Uh, now we're on to Argonite. I think it's Aragonite. Well, sure it is. Sure, Jason and the Aragonites. Wasn't that? That was Greek. So this has got to be Greek, right? Uh, I should spell it. Let's spell it. A-R-A-G-O-N-I-T-E. It's a noun. And it came to us in 1801, a mineral similar to calcite in consisting of calcium carbonate, but differing from calcite in its... Or... <laughs> There's that word again. Orthorhombic. Ah, crystallization. Okay, so that, that was an adjective and not a noun. So there we go. Uh, greater density and distinct cleavage. Which less, is less distinct less, cleavage. Oh, it's less distinct? Yeah, oh, sorry well, about that. But that's okay. You know where my mind goes when the word cleavage pops up. I'm looking for very distinct cleavage, but this is not in this word. All right, okay, so we can move on to uh, Eric. You think that's the pronunciation of that one? Uh, either that or a rock. Uh, it's spelled A-R-A-K. Yeah, but it's a variant of A-R-R-A-C-K. 
Yes. And it just it just stops. There's no more information about that word. Well, when we get to the ARRs, which are so far away. We're not going to do that today, are no. we? That's not, not going <laughs> to get there like, today. That's like five pages away. Okay. Well, so it just it's like a nail biter. This is a nail biter. We don't know about that one. Okay. So then we have Armenian, uh, right? No. no. Uh, Ara, Aramean. Uh, really? Yeah. So it was the Aramean genocide that happened in Turkey. I, sure. Really? I don't know. Okay. Well, let's find out. Oh, this is, could this is this could be something totally different. Uh, man, this is a noun, and uh, it became very fashionable in uh, 1689. So the number one definition is just yeah. the synonym Aramaic. Aramaic. Which um, I think. Oh yeah, we haven't gotten there quite. Or wait, did I read that already? Hold on. Well, it is alphabetical. No, it's right there. Aramaic. I see it. Down oh, the we're page. almost there. Yeah, yeah, we're it's almost there. It's the next there. word. It's the next word. Yep, yep. Aramean. Right. Okay, I Go can see what you're saying now about Aramean. I feel confident that that is the pronunciation, especially since it says it right there. Yes, that's and Armenian okay. has two ends. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. only has one. Sure, sure, sure. Totally other thing. Okay, so this one, uh, two. <laughs> yep. Yep. Is a uh, member of a Semitic people of the second millennium BC in Syria. And Upper Mesopotamia. And uh, Mark is reading a little slowly sometimes because, as we mentioned, the type is very small. small. And he has a little handheld flashlight, flashlight yeah, going yeah. right to the page. I'm going to have to take a picture of this. I need I need any help I can get. Uh, if I could hold the microphone and the magnifying glass and the flashlight at the same time, I would. Normally, I would have the flashlight in my mouth, but I cannot read with the flashlight. In my mouth. It would totally defeat the purpose yeah. of you being a guest reader. Yes, it would. It would. So, and I guess not being able to read would also defeat the purpose of being a guest reader, but we're, we're edging on that precipice. So where, where'd we go, Spencer, from here? Next is Aramaic. Aramaic. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a noun. 1813. A Semitic language known since the 9th century BC as the speech of the... Arameans. Arameans, right, and later used uh, extensively in Southwest Asia as a commercial and governmental language and adopted as their customary speech by various non-Aramean peoples, including the Jews, after the Babylonian exile. Exhilarating. Man, that was awesome. That was a really long definition. I really enjoyed that, though, because I feel like... uh, did you learn something? Well, my my curiosity is peaked about every single thing that I just read just then, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll often yeah. read definitions. I'm like, ooh, I need to look more into that. Yeah. Okay. So now we're on to the Aramaic alphabet. It's a noun, uh, which is weird because it's t- it should be nouns. Is there a plural for nouns? Just s on the end. It's well, two the, words. The no, no. It's one thing though. It's the Aramaic alphabet is it's one. Just a thing? It's just a one thing. It's so a it's concept. An, yep. Well, it's a it's a thing. It's an alphabet. Okay, so noun 1835. Uh, this is the first f- first uh, definition, first form. You're calling definition. It? Definition for okay. Number one. Uh, an extinct North Semitic alphabet dating from the ninth century BC, which was for several centuries the commercial alphabet of Southwest Asia and the parent of the other alphabets, as Syriac and Arabic. And in the last episode, I mentioned uh, the Arabic alphabet. Oh, okay. So this is great. We're just, uh, it's like as a theme. This is a theme. Uh, well, luckily, because they're they're spelled similarly, and they use the alphabet to, to spell, spell them. themselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Okay. So the second one, uh, the square Hebrew alphabet, uh, is distinguished from the early Hebrew alphabet. Oh, I don't know what the square Hebrew alphabet is. Sure. I don't know Hebrew, but. Maybe it's just more right angled. I don't know. Well, the other one was round or yeah, triangular, maybe. and then this one is squared. Yeah. Right. Not to be, not to be confused with L seven, which is a whole other kind of square. And we're not saying that the language is square, man. Mm-mm. Hey, you need to be more hip, man. Okay, so well, it oh, could be. It, it could be, be why it's extinct because maybe. it was square. It was square. It was formal. It was too formal. Yeah. For everybody on the in the streets to just okay. Uh, so now we're gonna go on to. Uh, Aramid, which I love this word. It is a noun, uh, and it became popular in 1972. I was born already, so that means I knew when this word came into existence, and I loved it since day one. Any 
of a group of lightweight but very strong heat resistant synthetic aromatic polymid polyamides uh, polyamide materials that are fashioned into fibers filaments or sheets and used especially in textiles and plastics which i believe is why kids caught on fire when they bought certain pajamas from department stores in the 70s uh flame it caught on fire i think this stuff just catch, i think kids run around it causes a friction and then it sparks and then it just catches on fire uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some relation. This says that it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, no, this says it's a right. very strong heat-resistant oh, synthetic sure, yeah, aromatic no. polyamide. Sure. So maybe this was invented to stop all the kids from catching on fire. Yeah, because I think like if a uh, certain... What was the, what's the polyester that catches on mm. fire? It's like a napalm. It just right, sticks right, right. to your skin. It's not any good. So maybe you this is... You do not want that. Yeah. Um, and the etymology of this just says it is from the words aromatic polyamide. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes the A-R from aromatic and the rest from polyamide. Although there's no E at the end of this word, aramid. It's A-R-A-M-I-D. Aramid. Yeah, right. Okay, fantastic. So uh, th this next word is... It, it's going to be our last one for the episode. And thank you very much. I will put everyone out of their misery now. You won't have to hear this, but it's it's a great word. I love it. It's a Rapaho. Uh, can you spell it for me? I, I can spell it. There are two ways to spell it, actually. A-R-A-P-A-H-O. And then there is an A-R-A-P-A-H-O-E. Uh, I don't know which which one. I kind of, I never, I've always seen it without the E on the end, but okay, here we go. Uh, it's a noun. Yep. Right? Yep. 1812. Seems like it would have been a word before 1812. Yeah. They were a nation of people before then, correct? Or were they named? I think this is the first known usage in the English language. Okay. That's what I'm so guessing. So it can't be trusted as far as its relation to I've Native never Americans. Trusted, I've never right? trusted the dictionary. Right. Or the English language. Or the, right. Okay. Well, uh, proud people. Um, <clears throat> awesome. Uh, so anyway, in 1812, I guess Americans decided to call them Arapaho. Uh, and the first uh, definition of this is a member of the American Indian uh, people of the Plains region ranging from Saskatchewan and Manitoba to New Mexico and Texas. That's a long, that's a big, that's, that's good. That's huge. Yeah, that's huge. Very, um, very cold and very warm. Right. They could migrate probably back and mm -hmm. forth. They had mm -hmm. That's okay. I will have to figure out more about their uh, migratory habits. But then uh, the second definition here we have is the uh, Algonquin language of the Arapaho people. So they speak Arapaho. Nice. Uh, recently, Sharon and I went to the Native American Museum, which is right down the street from where we live, and we have not been there until literally just a few weeks ago, a uh, month ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good. And oh. I recommend that if ever you're in Evanston, go check out the Native American Museum. Um, and they, they it's divided up into different or different sections of the museum are different areas that the American Indians lived. So there was the plain section, there mm -hmm. was the like uh, more northwest region, the the region in the east, the region in the, in the plains. It was all divided up by that. So it talked about their culture and their art and the food that they ate, and it was really really interesting. Okay, well I'm going tomorrow. Okay. 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 One last thing. Yeah, yeah. You need to pick a word for the episode. Mm -hmm. We use whatever criteria you want, mm -hmm. and it has to be from what you read. So starting with uh, sure. arachidonic acid all yeah, the way yeah. through Arapaho. And then what do I get to do with this? You just get to say which one it is, and that's it. The people want to know, Mark. I mean, obviously, I'm going for Arapaho. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm into it. Thank you very much, Spencer. That is the word of the episode. Thank you very much to all of you for listening. Thank you to Mark for taking uh, about 20 minutes out of his day to do this with me. Uh, and if he wants to do another one, he can. Awesome. Until next time, this is Spencer reading you the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. And as I was recording with Mark, I completely forgot to mention that today, October 9th, is the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. So, happy Yom Kippur. Uh, is there a different way to say that? I don't know. Let me know. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. How did you like Mark's episode? Would you like to have him be a guest reader again? Uh, go ahead and email me. Let me know your thoughts. 
All right. The first word for this episode is Araquanian. Capital A R A U C A N I A N. It could also be Araquan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but that's the way I'm going to say it. So this is a noun from 1777. One, a member of a group of Indian peoples of South Central Chile and adjacent regions of Argentina. Two, the language of the Araquanian people that constitutes an independent language family. Araucanian is also an adjective. And the etymology says this is Spanish from Araucano, which is from Arauco, which is a former province in Chile. Next, we have Araucaria. I'm wondering, yep, I think this is related. Uh, So this is a noun from 1806. Any of a genus of South American or Australian coniferous trees that resemble pines and are often grown as ornamentals, especially the synonym monkey puzzle. What the what is a monkey puzzle? I need to know what this is. Araucarian is an adjective. And yes, this is also from that word Arauco, A-R-A-U-C-O. Next we have uh, Arawak or Arawak, capital A-R-A-W-A-K. This is a noun from 1769. One, a member of an Indian people of the Arawakan group now living chiefly along the coast of Guyana, G-U-Y-A-N-A. Or is it Guyana? I don't know, Guyana, something like that. I don't mean to brush that off. I just don't know the proper way, so I'm just going to say it how I'm going to say it. Two, the language of the Arawak people. So the etymology says um, earlier, Arawaka, A-R-W-A-C-A, or Arawaka, A-R-O-A-C-A, which is an Arawak subgroup of 16th century Trinidad, perhaps from an Arawak name for the subgroup. And now we have Arawakan, so we've added an A-N to the end of the word. It sort of seems like a word you'd see in Star Wars or something. Uh, so this is a noun from 1848. One, a member of a group of Indian peoples of South America and the West Indies. Two, the language family of the Arawakan peoples. Next we have Arb, A-R-B. This is a noun from 1979, and we have the synonym Arbitrager, A-R-B-I-T-R-A-G-E-U-R, Arbitrager. I'm sure we'll get to that soon. But next we have Arbalest, or Arbalist, A-R-B-A-L-E-S-T. This is a noun from before the 12th century. It is a crossbow, especially of medieval times. Arbalest. Next we have Arbiter. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, a person with power to decide a dispute. Synonym is judge. Two, a person or agency whose judgment or opinion is considered authoritative, as in arbiters of taste. Next, we have uh, an interesting word. It is arbiter elegantiarum. That was two separate words. Elegantiarum, I hope I pronounced correctly, and it is spelled E-L-E-G-A-N-T-I-A-R-U-M. This is a noun from 1728. A person who prescribes, rules on, or is a recognized authority on matters of social behavior and taste. This is Latin, and it literally means arbiter of refinements. Next, we have arbitrable. A-R-B-I-T-R-A-B-L-E. This is an adjective from 1531, subject to decision by arbitration. And arbitrage is our next word. It is the first form of two. This is a noun from 1875. One, the nearly simultaneous purchase and sale of securities or foreign exchange in different markets in order to profit from price discrepancies. Two, the purchase of the stock of a takeover target, especially with a view to selling it profitably to the raider. The etymology says this is French, from the Middle French, which means arbitration, from the Old French, uh, from arbitraire. I'm just reading this as is, so that's why it kind of comes out funny. 
Um, arbitraire means to render judgment, and that is from the Latin arbitrari, uh, which is from the prefix arbiter uh, or arbitraire. Moving on to arbitrage, uh, second form. It is an intransitive verb from circa 1896 to engage in arbitrage. And next we have that funky word that I was having trouble with before uh, the abbreviation was ARB. Uh, actually, technically that one was not an abbreviation. Uh, I guess it was just a short form. So this one is pronounced, I guess, arbitrageur or arbitrageur. A-R-B-I-T-R-A-G-E-U-R. It's a noun from 1870, one that practices arbitrage. Next is arbitral, A-R-B-I-T-R-A-L. This is an adjective from 1609, relating to arbiters or arbitration. And I think we will go ahead and do one more for this episode. It is arbitrament, A-R-B-I-T-R-A-M-E-N-T. This is a noun from the 14th century. One is archaic, the right or power of deciding. Two, the settling of a dispute by an arbiter. Three, the judgment given by an arbitrator. I think I'm going to pick, uh, let's see, Araquanian, the first one, and Arawak as the words of the episode because I just like that it's bringing some attention to um, uh, people's around the world that most people aren't aware of. You know, these, these are groups of people who have lived for many, many years, and I had never heard of them before. Uh, and so I think it's good to just bring some more attention to the fact that they exist, what their name is, where they live, um, and I think that's good. So that's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this episode of The Dictionary. We are in October still. It's fall. I just realized that I recorded uh, half to two-thirds of this episode and my recorder wasn't recording. I'm pretty sure that's the first time it's happened to me and I hope it is the last because that's kind of a pain. So, let's do this again. First word is arbitrary. A-R-B-I-T-R-A-R-Y. This is an adjective from the 15th century. One, depending on individual discretion as of a judge and not fixed by law, as in, the manner of punishment is arbitrary. 2a, not restrained or limited in the exercise of power, colon, ruling by absolute authority, as in, an arbitrary government. 2b, marked by or resulting from the unrestrained and often tyrannical exercise of power, as in, protection from arbitrary arrest and detention. 3a, based on or determined by individual preference or convenience rather than by necessity or the intrinsic nature of something, as in, an arbitrary standard. And wait for it, we have two more examples. Also as in, Take any arbitrary positive number. And the last example for this one is arbitrary division of historical studies into watertight compartments. And that is from A.J. Toynbee. Here we go with 3B. Existing or coming about seemingly at random or by chance, or as a capricious and unreasonable act of will. As in, when a task is not seen in a meaningful context, it is experienced as being arbitrary. And that is from Nehemiah Jordan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing Nehemiah correctly, but it is spelled N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H, so it seems like it should be pronounced Nehemiah. Arbitrarily is an adverb, and arbitrariness is a noun. Now we have arbitrate. It's a verb from 1588. Transitive definitions are first. One is archaic. And we have these synonyms decide and determine. Two, to act as arbiter upon. Three, to submit or refer for decision to an arbiter, as in agreed to arbitrate their differences. Now we have the intransitive definition. It says to act as arbiter. Arbitrative is an adjective. Now we have arbitration. This is a noun from the 15th century. The action of arbitrating, especially 
the hearing and determination of a case in controversy by an arbiter. Arbitrational is an adjective. Now we have arbitrator, and I'm pretty sure that this is the last of the words that are related to arbitration and arbitrating and stuff. So this is a noun from the 15th century, one that arbitrates. Synonym is arbiter. Here we go with arbor, A-R-B-O-R. It's the first form of two. This is a noun from the 14th century, a shelter of vines or branches or of latticework covered with climbing shrubs or vines. And there is a picture of an arbor, and it looks exactly how they described, although uh, on one of the sides there is a little bench, so it looks like a very nice place to sit. The etymology says this is from Middle English, uh, erber, E-R-B-E-R, or also erber with an H at the beginning. You could say erber or herber, I don't know which is uh, proper, Uh, and that means garden, and that is from the French herb, H-E-R-B-E, which means herb or grass. Now we have the second form of arbor. This is a noun from 1659. One, a spindle or axle of a wheel. Two, a main shaft or beam. Three, a shaft on which a revolving cutting tool is mounted. Four, a spindle on a cutting machine that holds the work to be cut. Arbor is Latin, and it means tree or shaft. Now we have arbor as a prefix. Uh, could also be arbory with an I, uh, and it just means tree, basically related to tree, as in arboriculture. Next we have Arbor Day. Two words, the first letter is capitalized. This is a noun from 1863, a day designated for planting trees. How many people actually plant a tree on Arbor Day? Pretty sure most people don't even know Arbor Day exists, or when they hear it, They think, what the hell is that? What do I do? Nothing. Go to work. Okay. But I like this idea of planting trees on Arbor Day, and maybe every day. So maybe I'll try and do that. When is Arbor Day? I should look that up. Next, we have arboreal. A-R-B-O-R-E-A-L. This is an adjective from circa 1667. One, of relating to or resembling a tree. Two, Inhabiting or frequenting trees, as in arboreal monkeys. Arboreally is an adverb. This is uh, from the Latin arboreus, which means of a tree. And it looks like arboreus is our next word, although it is spelled uh, a little bit differently than the Latin word. A-R-B-O-R-E-O-U-S. This is an adjective from 1646, and we have the synonym arboreal, which is what we just read, as in an arboreous palm, P-A-L-M. That's a palm tree, not the palm on your hand. Next we have arborescent, A-R-B-O-R-E-S-C-E-N-T. This is an adjective from 1675, resembling a tree in properties, growth, structure, or appearance. Arborescence is a noun. Next we have arboretum, This is a noun from 1796, a place where trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants are cultivated for scientific and educational purposes. There might actually be an arboretum literally just a few blocks away from where I am right now. I don't remember if it's called an arboretum, but there's some sort of ecology center nearby, uh, and I have a vague memory of it saying arboretum, but I am probably wrong. So this is Latin, and it means plantation of trees. Next, we have arboriculture, which I think was our example in the arbor prefix word definition thing. So this is a noun from circa 1778, the cultivation of trees and shrubs, especially for ornamental purposes. Arboricultural is an adjective. So for many years of my life, I have had this urge to do some sort of arboriculture thing, I I didn't really think about the word arboriculture, but I wanted to plant trees and then as they grew, sort of gradually shape them into, I don't know, shapes or or something. Uh, I never did this. I was not motivated enough to learn the proper way to do it or the proper trees to plant or or even to just to take the time. Um, So I'm quite a bit older from when I had this idea first, and so I'm probably not ever going to do it. But 
if you like this idea and you are young enough or can pass this along to someone who is young, I think it's a great idea. Some ideas I had were just uh, putting trees, maybe spiraling them, maybe slowly bending the branches so they just created some sort of shape. I don't know what that would be. Um, I saw, I've seen some picture of somebody who created uh, a chair. I, I couldn't even describe exactly what he did or how he did it, but I'm pretty sure that this is a living tree of some kind that he was able to bend into the shape of a chair. It's really fascinating. I'll see if I can find a picture online and, and post a link. Um, what other things? I've seen people who put uh, a board in between two trees and then the bark grows over the board and it becomes a little bench. Um, I went to a camp that had something like that. So, uh, like I said, if you're young enough, I think you should uh, get into arboriculture. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just just do something. And here we go with the last word of the episode. It is arboreo rice. Two separate words. Arboreo is spelled A-R-B-O-R-I-O. This is a noun. Uh, it is often capitalized with a capital A. Because it is from Arborio, which is a village in the Piedmont region of Italy. Did I say it was from 1976? I don't remember, but I just said it again. This is a short grain rice that has a creamy texture when cooked and is typically used in risotto. So I think I'm going to have to pick uh, one of these arbor words, or maybe just arbor uh, which will encapsulate all of the arbor words. I am a big fan of trees and nature in general. I've always loved trees. Um, arboric culture I like because it's talking about cultivating trees in ornamental ways. Uh, and I think we need a little bit more uh, love for nature in our world. You might think that we have a lot, and I think we do, but I think we need a little bit more because the Amazon is burning right now, and that is bad. Uh, my wife has a beautiful uh, tree tattoo on her back. It's her in, basically her entire back. It took very, very long to create and a lot of pain, a lot of money, uh, but it is beautiful and totally worth it. Uh, so if you ever see it, you should say, hey, take off your shirt. Let me, sh let me see your tattoo. No, don't do that. But people have literally started to pull up her shirt to see her tattoo, and that is inappropriate. So don't do that when you see somebody's tattoo. You can respectfully ask them to see their tattoo, uh, but don't start touching them and pulling up their clothes and stuff. And on that note, this is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode episode, episode of the dictionary. This is my podcast. How weird is this? I am at the top of page 64. When I'm 64, that is a long way away. All right, the first word for this episode is arborist, A-R-B-O-R-I-S-T. This is a noun from 1578, a specialist in the care and maintenance of trees. How cool would it have been to have that as your job? Like, I'm helping these trees that uh, give us life. Next is uh, arborization. This is a noun from 1794. Formation of or into a dendritic process of a neuron. Did I say the whole thing? No. Formation of or into an adborescent figure arrangement. Also, such a figure or arrangement as a dendritic process of a neuron. Next, we have another tree word. It is arborize. This is an intransitive verb from 1847, to branch freely and repeatedly. I think I need to angle the book so I can read it a little bit, little bit better. All right, next we have arbor vitae, uh, or no, or viti, uh, vitae, actually, arbor vitae. That is not how I wanted to pronounce that. A-R-B-O-R-V-I-T-A-E. This is a noun from 1646. Any of various evergreen trees and shrubs, especially genus Thuja, uh, of the cypress family that usually have closely overlapping or compressed scale leaves and are often grown for ornament and in hedges. I have no idea what I'm reading. 
Uh, all right, that is uh, new Latin, literally means tree of life. Ooh, that's cool. All right, next we have arbor. A-R-B-O-U-R. This is a chiefly British variation of arbor without the U, the way we here in America spell it. All right, next we have arbovirus. This does not sound fun. Uh, this is a noun from 1957. Any of various RNA viruses as the causative agents of equine encephalitis, sandly, oh no, sandfly fever, and West Nile fever, transmitted chiefly by arthropods. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to cough, and I didn't want to do it in the microphone. All right, next we have arbutus. Yeah, is that how it's pronounced? A-R-B-U-T-U-S. This is a noun from 1548. One, any of a genus, arbutus, of shrubs and trees of the heath family with white or pink flowers and red uh, or orange berries. Two, a creeping plant of the heath family they're in the same family, that occurs in eastern North America and bears fragrant pink or white flowers in early spring. They sound pretty similar. Next, we have arc. Oh, actually, the etymology. Uh, it is New Latin from, uh, or just a Latin word, uh, that means strawberry tree. All right, next we have arc, A-R-C. This is the first form of a three. Usually we have two. Now we have three. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, the apparent path described above and below the horizon of a celestial body as the sun. Two, a, something arced or arched, it's a ch, uh, or curved. Two, b, a curved path, as in the arc of a fly ball. It's really interesting how predictable... Uh, physics is. I never took physics in high school, um, but because we know how much gravity there is uh, from the Earth, we can we can predict things like that. Uh, you know what what the arc is going to be based on its speed and velocity and all that. Fascinating stuff. All right, number three: a sustained luminous discharge of electricity across a gap in a circuit or between electrodes, also synonym arc lamp. I'm going to put the microphone down because I need some water. Is this real enough? Uh, all right, where were we? Number four, four arc. A continuous portion as of a circle or a uh, eclipse. No, ellipse. Circle or ellipse of a curved line. Five. Degree measurement on the circumference of a circle used especially in the phrase of arc, as in 11 minutes, 3 seconds of arc. Yep. Okay. I guess that has to do with, uh, yeah, when you're going out into space. Oh, no, no. It's the, uh, it's the way, um, yeah, if a circle is d divided into 360 degrees, is that where they get the minutes and seconds? I don't know. You should probably cut that part out. Six, a continuous progression or line of development, as in a story's arc, uh, a story's dramatic arc. All right, now we have the second form of arc. It's an intransitive verb from 1893. One, to form an electric arc. Two, to follow an arc-shaped course. Next, we have the third form of arc. This is an adjective from circa 1949. Uh, we have the two definition for inverse, used with the trigonometric functions of hyperbolic functions. Huh? Oh, no. Trigonomic functions and hyperbolic functions. Uh, the etymology says arc, sine, arc, or angle corresponding to the sine of so many degrees. Next, we have ARC, all caps. This is an abbreviation for 1, AIDS-related complex, or 2, American Red Cross. And should we do another one? Yeah, I think we'll do one more for this episode. It is the word arcade, A-R-C-A-D-E, something that I enjoyed as a kid, but now I'm an adult reading the dictionary. This is a noun from 1725. One, a long arced or arched building or gallery. I assume it's arched. Uh, number two, an arched uh, sorry, let me do that again. An arched covered passageway or avenue as between shops. 
Three, a series of arches with their columns or piers. Four, an amusement center having coin-operated games. My favorite. Man, we... I, I wasn't as bad as a lot of kids, but we would definitely spend a lot of time at an arcade. Uh, it just reminds me of... Uh, what's that vampire movie? The Lost Boys. Reminds me of that. Uh, but I didn't really grow up with something like that. Uh, but I do remember going to this one place in Chicago with my friends, and we even had birthdays there sometimes, and uh, there was a game called Trog, and I don't know, for some reason I loved it. I guess it was because it was literally clay stop-motion animation uh, turned into a video game, and it was a prehistoric Pac-Man game where you were a dinosaur who would hop from space to space or just go around space to space picking up eggs like they were uh, the Pac-Man pellets, And then there were these trog characters, which were these cavemen who had, uh, they they were, um, why can I not think of the word? They had one eye. They were a cyclops, and they would try and get you, and it was all stop-motion animation, and it was so cool, and I'm going to stop talking about that game, and we are going to end the episode. So clearly, I'm going to pick arcade as the word of the episode, Uh, and that was it. That was the top of page 64. Thank you, and good night. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I rambled on a little too much in the last one, so I'm going to see if I can tone it down for this one. So the first word of this episode is arcaded. A-R-C-A-D-E-D. This is an adjective from 1805. Having formed in or decorated with arches or arcades, as in arcaded streets. Also as in an arcaded bowl, B-O-W-L. Next, we have arcade game, a noun from 1978, and it has the synonym video game. Next, we have Arcadia, A-R-C-A-D-I-A. This is a noun from circa 1890. I wish you could hear my voice in your head the way I hear it. I think we all think our voice sounds so much better than it really does. And when you have headphones on, when you're listening to your own voice, it's very strange. Very strange. What were we talking about? This is Arcadia, a region or scene or simple pleasure and quiet. Uh, This is from uh, the region of ancient Greece, frequently chosen as background for pastoral poetry. Next, we have Arcadian. It's an adjective from uh, 1565, 1A, of or relating to Arcadia or the Arcadians, 1B, of or relating to Arcadian, 2, idyllically pastoral, especially idyllically innocent, simple, or untroubled. Like, why, why do they have to say especially? Couldn't they just throw them all together? All right, next we have Arcadian with a capital A. This is a noun from 1573. One is often not capitalized. A person who lives a simple, quiet life. Two, a native or inhabitant of Arcadia. Three, the dialect of ancient Greek used in Arcadia. I feel like they could have combined these two Arcadian words, uh, one without caps and one with caps, Mm, just my two cents. There must be some reason why they're different. Next, we have Arcadian, or or Arcading, with a G at the end. Uh, This is a noun from 1849, a series of arches or arcades used in the construction or decoration especially of a building. Next, we have Arcady, with a capital A. This is a noun from the 14th century, and we have the synonym Arcadia. All right, we've talked about Arcadia quite a lot. Let's move on to arcane. This is an adjective from 1547. Known or knowable only to the initiate. Uh, Synonym is secret, as in arcane rites. And now we have uh, the word broadly in italics. The synonyms mysterious and obscure. So broadly, the idea is mysterious and obscure. The The idea of arcane. That's not really how I would have thought it, but maybe I was just wrong. Uh, All right, the uh, as in, arcane explanations. Next, we have arcanum with an N-U-M at the end. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, mysterious or specialized knowledge, language, or information accessible or possessed only by the initiate. 
usually used in plural. Number two, we have the first definition for the word elixir. And the etymology says this is Latin from the neutral arcanus, which means secret, from arca, which means chest, and more at the word arc. Next, we have arcasign. This is a noun from circa 1884, the inverse function of the cosine, as in, if y is the cosine of zero, then zero is the arcosine, or r cosine, of y. There you go. Next, we have arch. Uh, this is the first form of four. Yeah, four. Well, kind of more than that, actually, but we'll get there later. Stay tuned. So arch is a noun from the 14th century. One, a typically curved structural member spanning an opening and serving as a support, as for the wall or other weight above the opening. I think it's time for some water. Stand by. Excuse me. Where did we leave off? 2A, I think, is what I need to read. Something resembling an arch in form or function, especially either of two vaulted portions of the bony structure of the foot that impart elasticity to it. Whatever you said. 2B, a curvature having the form of an arch. 3, synonym is archway. And here we come to a picture. Ooh, this reminds me of we uh, when we had the picture of the anchor. And there were five different kinds of anchors. So here we have seven different kinds of arches. Okay, arch number one. Uh, no, wait. So this says arch, the first definition of the word arch, which I will reread for you, is a typically curved structural member spanning an opening and serving as a support, as for the wall or other weight above the opening. All right, so this is what we typically think of as an arch. Um, so number one is called round. Um, oh, this is hard to read. Okay, two is a horseshoe. I Okay, three is a lancet. That one's kind of pointed. The first one is round. Oh, it describes the different parts. Okay, let's read them first. Four is an OG or OG. Do not know how to pronounce that word. Uh, so the left and right sides are curved, and then they come to a point. Uh, it's sort of like an inverted point. One is concave and one is convex. I'm not sure which is which. Uh, number five is called a trefoil, which is where the sides come in, and then they bounce back out, and then they come to a point at the top. I'm sure this is riveting for you to listen to me describe these arches. Uh, it's riveting for me. Six is called basket handle. So this is not, uh, it's not a perfectly um, half of a circle at the top. It's widened. It's more like half of, uh, of an ellipse. Yeah, that's probably right. Uh, seven is Tudor. Uh, and so the left and right sides go up uh, straight vertical um, and then they kind of come in at about a 45 degree angle sort of at, a, at a, a gentle arch or no a gentle curve you would say uh, and then they come to a point um, and I'm not even going to read those things so now we have the second form of arch this is a transitive verb from the 15th century one to cover or provide with an arch two to form into an arch uh, now we have the intransitive definitions one to form an arch and two, to make an arch-shaped course. Here we have the third uh, form of, yes, the third form of arch. It's an adjective from 1547. One, we have the synonyms principal and chief, as in your arch opponent. Is this arc? I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. Two, A, mischievous or saucy. Those are the synonyms. Two, B, marked by a deliberate and often forced playfulness, irony, or impudence, as in known for her arch comments. No, it's got to be arc comments. Um, also as in decided to answer them by being treacherly, no, teacherly. Let me read that again. Decided to answer them by being teacherly in a sort of arc. That is from Olympian Way, uh, which is written by G uh, Gerald Early. Is that right? Olympian Way, is that the name of a... I don't know what that is. Um, archness is a noun. 
Uh, now we have the fourth form of arch. I promised there would be four. This is an abbreviation for one, archaic, two, archery, three, architect, architectural, and architecture. Now we have arch with a capital A. It's an abbreviation for archbishop. And um, now we come to a word. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do this. Uh, so this is arch as a prefix, um, probably arc pronounced arc in this case. Uh, this is the first form of two. The second one is on the second column, but we'll do both. Um, all right, so this is, uh, okay, number one, chief principal, as in, no, chief colon principal, as in arch fiend. Yeah, I think arch fiend. Um, number two, extreme, most fully embodying the qualities of the kind, as in arch conservative. I think I'm going to skip the etymology. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, now we have the second form of the prefix arch, and it just says, see, arch prefix with, yeah. Well, that's what we just read. Why did you need to put that in there? Okay, well, that was a weird way to end this episode. Um, what are we going to pick for the word of the episode? Well, obviously, it has to be arch because I spent so much time describing those seven beautiful arches. Um, and yeah, that's the end of the episode. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. <clears throat> wow, I should have done that first. Um... I know I'm going to have to take a drink at some point in this episode, so just be ready for that. Hi, how are you? What's going on? Here we have the first form of arch as a suffix. This word is everything. Let's bring the book a little closer. Um, okay, this is uh, means ruler or leader, as in matriarch. Now that one's matriarch. Yeah, that's definitely matriarch. The etymology says some things that I can't pronounce, so I'm going to skip that. Now we have the second form of arch as a suffix. Maybe this one is pronounced arch. Let's see. Uh, it's an adjective, but also a suffix. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so having such... No, let's start that over. Having such a point or so many points of origin. That was a weird sentence. Let's try that again without the parts in the parentheses. Ready? Okay, let's go. Having a point or points of origin. Well, that makes much more sense. Um, and as in, here we go with an example, end arch or end, yeah, end arch. I, th this concept is, I don't understand. I'm going to have to look into this one later. All right, now we have archy. Uh, uh, so this is A-R-C-H-A-E, like archaeology. I assume we're going to see that as an example. It means <clears throat> ancient, primitive, as in archaeopteryx. Ooh, every time I pronounce that word, I'm actually incredibly proud that I actually know how to pronounce it. And I think I said actually multiple times. Um, yeah, archaeopteryx, that's one of those um, ancient and primitive big bad birds. Uh, let's see, that's the definition, and the etymology is from, I'm losing my place, is from Greek, I should have known, means um, ar ar archaeos, I will get rid of the stutter this time, archaeos, uh, and that means ancient, from archi, meaning beginning. Now we have archaea, this is a noun from 1990 microorganisms of a domain, including especially methane or methane producing forms, some red halophilic, halopho, hal, oh, halophilic forms, that's a mouthful, and others of harsh, hot, acidic environments as a hot spring compared to the words, the words bacterium and eukaryote. Uh, archaeal is an adjective and archaean is an adjective or a noun. Now we have Archibacterium. Uh, that's what I'm going to name my son. This is a noun from 1977. Any of the microorganisms comprising the archaea. Now we have Archaea Astronomy. Yeah, that's his sister. Uh, this is a noun from 1971. The study of the astronomy of ancient cultures. This actually sounds very fascinating and something that I talked about a few episodes ago. 
Now we have archaeology. Uh, let's see. This is a noun from 1837. One, the scientific study of material remains as fossil relics, artifacts, and monuments of past human life and activities. Ew. Can it be other life, not just human life? Archaeology? Yeah. Should be all life. Uh, number two, remains of the culture of a people. Synonym is antiquities. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe archaeology is just people. I never really thought about that. Uh, let's see. Archaeological is an adjective. Archaeologically is an adverb. And archaeologist is a noun. Um, the um, etymology, not synonyms, comes from the French French archaeologie, uh, which is from Latin archaeologia, which means antiquarian lore, which is from the Greek archaeologia. Uh, let's see, which means logi. Okay, archaeopteryx. Ooh, this is where the word came in, and I think I'm going to get some water. If you haven't realized, I'm not editing. Editing is for chumps. Uh, okay, ooh, my favorite word, word, archaeopteryx. This is a noun from 1859, a primitive, lose your place, a primitive crow-sized bird um, of the upper Jurassic period of Europe having reptilian characteristics as teeth and a long bony tail. Um, yeah, so it's from archi, the prefix archi, plus the Greek pteryx, uh, which means wing, it's akin to the Greek pteron, which means wing, and there's more at the word feather. And I was just talking to my family this morning about my podcast. Um, as you may remember, if you listen to these in order, uh, I am visiting my, or to earlier today, I visited my grandparents who are 93 and 94 uh, because my grandma just had her 93rd birthday and, and other family members were there as well. Oh, anyway, we were talking about this podcast and one of the words I mentioned that I remembered was apteris or apteris. Um, which means without wings. And my aunt is a scientist, or, or um, she was a, a science teacher, but she's a scientist because she's a teacher, and uh, studying those kids. And uh, she said, yeah, that's from the word, uh, the base word pteron, P-T-E-R-O-N. Uh, that's the Greek one. Anyway, why did I tell that story? I don't know. Let's move on. Um, archaic is an adjective from 1832. One, having the characteristics of the language of the past and surviving chiefly in specialized uses, as in an archaic word. Two, of relating to or characteristic of an earlier or more primitive time. Uh, synonym is antiquated, as in archaic legal traditions. I'm switching hands because this one is feeling funny. Um, so, three is capitalized of or belonging to the early or formative phases of a cultural or a period of artistic development, especially of or belonging to the period leading up to the classical period of Greek culture. That was a long definition. Four, surviving from an earlier period, specifically typical of a previously dominant evolutionary stage. Five is capitalized of or relating to the period from about 8,000 BC to 1,000 BC and the North American, where to go, cultures of that time. Synonym, see the word old. Yes, archaic is old. I'm starting to feel archaic. Archaic Lee is an adverb. This might be the end of this episode. Um, well, archaeopteryx is definitely the word of the episode. And one last note. Why why are you listening to this podcast? This is such a weird idea. Why am I doing this? I don't know. It's funny. Let's move on to the next episode. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Let's get right to the talking uh, so there's as little dead air as possible. Okay, the first for this episode is archaic smile. Two words. Archaic, as a reminder, is A-R-C-H-A-I-C. This is a noun from circa 1902. 
an expression that resembles a smile and is characteristic of early Greek sculpture. Is it like that sort of half little smile that's not really there? Now we have archaism. This is a noun from 1643. One, the use of archaic diction or style. Two, an instance of archaic usage. Three, something archaic, especially something as a practice or custom that is outmoded or old-fashioned. Archaist is a noun. Archistic, uh, archaistic is an adjective. And archaize, archaize, yeah, uh, that's a verb. Um, all right, next we have archangel or archangel. Man, I keep on getting confused by that arch arc thing. This is what? This is a noun from the 12th century. One, a chief angel. Two is plural, an order of angels. See the celestial hierarchy. That's what it tells me to do. Again, um, I think we brought this one up before. Yeah, I'm really curious what that looks like. Archangelic is an adjective. Has, has anyone ever described something as archangelic? I don't think so. Um, okay, next we have Archbishop. This is a noun from before the 12th century. These are old words, people. A bishop at the head of an ecclesiastical province or one of equivalent honorary rank. Etymology says, uh, I'll give you this, just a little bit, a taste, if you will, uh, from the Greek archiepiskopos. Sure, uh, which is from episkopos, which means bishop. And there's more at the word bishop. Next, we have archbishopric. Bishopric, yeah, I think that's it. This is a noun from before the 12th century. One, the sea or province over which an archbishop exercises authority. I'm now totally second guessing myself in this arch arc business. Archbishop? Archbishop? I think it's archbishop. Two, the jurisdiction or office of an archbishop. I am totally overthinking this. All right, next we have archconservative. This is a noun from 1934, an extreme conservative. Archconservative is also an adjective. And at this point, you can just fill in whatever it should be because I don't even know at this point. Uh, but it definitely says arch in the pronunciation guide, A-R-C-H. So that's what we're going to go on when it tells me that. Next, next is archdeacon. This is a noun from uh, before the 12th century. A clergyman having the duty or a... No. A clergyman or men, clergyman, having the duty of assisting a diocesan bishop in ceremonial functions or administrative work. This is one of those times that I should probably edit out, but I'm not going to. My watch buzzed, and I usually put it on airplane mode, so let me do that. Thank you for letting me do that. And what was the other thing? What is this word that I just tried to read? I, th so I know it's the diocese, So, but they added an A-N. So is it diocesan? I don't know. Next, we have archdeaconry. This is a noun from 1529. The district or residence of an archdeacon. Now we have archdiocese. This is a noun from 1844. The diocese of an archbishop. Archdiocesan. Well, let's look at the pronunciation guide. Archdiocesan. That might be more accurate. Um, also, da, 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 da. that's an adjective. Archdiocesan season, that's an adjective. Now we have archducal, hmm, uh, like an archduke. Uh, this is an adjective from 1665, of or relating to an archduke or archduchy. Duchy? Duchy, yep, duchy. Uh, okay, where was that? Uh, now we have archduchess. This is a noun from 1555. One, the wife or widow of an archduke. Two, a woman having in her own right a rank equal to that of an archduke. Now we have archduchy. Yeah, I'm looking at the pronunciation guide. Uh, it is spelled D-U-C-H-Y. This is a noun from 1530. The territory of an archduke 
or Archduchess. There are texts happening on my phone, and I'm going to ignore them for another couple of minutes. Then, whoa, what was that? Next, we have Archduke. This is a noun uh, from the 15th century. One, a sovereign prince. Two, a prince of the imperial family of Austria. Archdukedom is a noun. And yes, I realize I could have totally ignored telling you that I had texts coming in on my phone. And why is my watch buzzing again? I turned you off. Practically, sort of, not really. Okay, now we have Archean, capital A-R-C-H-E-A-N, or it could also be A-E-A-N. That's a lot of vowels. Uh, This is an adjective from 1872, one of relating to or being the earliest eon of geological history or the corresponding system of rocks. And then it tells me to see the geologic timetable. Am I going to look at that now? No, I am not. But I will be interested in it when I get there. Because I took a class when I was at the University of Iowa uh, called the Science of Evolution, the History of Evolution, something about evolution. So we went through all of those time periods. And it was actually really fascinating. Uh, I did learn a lot. I also forgot a lot. But it was a good basis of scientific knowledge. Um, number two for Archean, or no, this case it is Archean. Um, number two, the synonym is Precambrian, which I think is one of the chunks. Uh, or no, I guess it, it's they just go by the same name. Yeah, that's one of the chunks in the geologic timetable. Uh, but you already knew that. Archean is a noun. Now we have Archegonium, Archegonium, A-R-C-H-E-G-O-N-I-U-M. This is a noun from 1854. The flask-shaped, whoa, wasn't ready for that. The flask-shaped female sex organ of bryophytes, lower vascular plants as ferns, and some uh, gymnosperms. Are those like sperms that are uh, doing the rings and the balance beam and this stuff? Um, I don't think so. Archegonical um, is an adjective. The watch is going to keep on buzzing and I'm going to keep on ignoring it. Except when I say stuff like that. Next we have arch enemy. This is a noun from 1550. A principal enemy. Next we have archenteron. A-R-C-H-E-N-T-E-R-O-N. Archenteron. It sounds like the name of a uh, an alien uh, king. An alien king. I got it out. Um, all right. This is a noun from 1877. The cavity of a gastrula forming a primitive gut. That is not an alien king. Uh, far from it. Next, we have archaeol. It's an abbreviation for archaeology. We're almost to the end of this episode, don't worry. Um, Archaeozoic is our next word. This is an adjective from 1872. We have the uh, first definition for archaean, and archaeozoic is also a noun. Now we have archer. It's a noun and the name of a really awesome cartoon. Uh, But it's not for kids, so if you're a kid, don't go watch it. But you should go watch it. It's great. Uh, All right. This is from the 14th century. One, a person who uses a bow and arrow. Two is capitalized. It's the synonym Sagittarius. Uh, And I don't know my constellations, but I think there is one with a guy holding a bow and arrow. So it must be this one. See how I figured that out using my brain? The etymology says this is from the Latin Arcarius, which is an alternative of Aquarius. Uh, with a C-U-A, and that is from um, Arquarius, of, which means of a bow, and Arcus means bow, and there's more at the word arrow. And here we go with the last word for this episode, the end of page 64. Um, Archerfish, that's what it is. I would love it if Archer made an episode where all of them were fish. That would be amazing. Stupid, but amazing. Archerfish is A-R-C-H-E-R-F-I-S-H. This is a noun from circa 1889. Any of several small East Indian bony fishes. We'll read the 
part in parentheses next, that catches insects by stunning them with water ejected from their mouths. Ooh, I think I just saw a video about, uh, or it was a, sl a collection of slow motion nature footage. Um, I might be able to find the link actually. And in there was one of those creatures shooting water out of its mouth. And I was like, oh, I think I know what that is, even though they didn't even show what it was doing. So if you've never seen it before, you would be clueless. Um, the part in parentheses is genus Toxates, and especially T, which I assume stands for Toxates, um, ejaculator. Uh, okay, this again took a turn that I wasn't ready for. I sort of thought that I was reading that word as I was reading the other lines, but I wasn't quite sure. But yeah, it's literally ejaculating water from its mouth. Uh, this is this is science. This is real life, people. Deal with it. All right, what is the word of the episode? I'm not going to pick any of these archangel, archbishop, archdeacon, archduchess, archduke. Jesus. i um, not going to pick any of those. So I guess we're just going to pick archerfish because that is funny. All right, that's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Seriously, why you're listening to this in the first place is baffles me. Um, ooh, oh, yesterday, I missed it. That's okay. Yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day in many parts of the country. Um, I wish I would have put this in yesterday, but uh, I'm getting to it. I have it in my notes. I did pre-plan to say this. I just forgot it. Um, yeah, Indigenous Peoples Day... <sighs> I, I can't even get into this right now, but you you get it. You get it. All right. Bye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this new episode of The Dictionary. Thank you very much for joining me. Off the bat, I am going to say, uh, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about this whole no editing thing. Up until, I think, four episodes ago, I had been doing pretty heavy editing. Um, nothing crazy, but I would look at a word, make sure I was pronouncing it correctly or, or pretty close to it. Um, there would be extra pauses, things like that. But I am going to try for as long as I can to do no editing. I'm literally taking from the moment I hit record to the moment I stop recording that entire clip on my audio recorder, and that is the episode. If something goes terribly wrong, if I'm interrupted, if I have a heart attack... Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but if something really bad goes wrong, then I will edit that. Uh, but for as long as I can, I'm going to try no editing. The reason is, I I think it's more real. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I like when they are real. People are talking about real things, real life. You see, you hear behind the scenes things about uh, the the process of podcasting, their lives. I don't know what it is. I just think it's fascinating. It's not just with podcasts. It's with everything. I, I think it's really nice and refreshing when people are real. So that is what I'm here to give you. Uh, this is real. My mouth is getting all smacky and I need to swallow. So I'm going to do that and it's not going to get edited out. In the last few episodes, you heard me take a drink. Uh, that was left in. It might not be for everybody. Apologies. I'll see how it goes for a while. Uh, but I did want to mention uh, that and, and my feelings about that. So let's get to the words. We are starting at the top of page 65. This word is archery. A-R-C-H-E-R-Y. And I think I'm going to raise the volume on this recorder just a little bit. Okay, this is a noun from the 15th century. One, the art of practice, or skill of shooting with bow and arrow. Two, an archer's weapons. Three, a body of archers. I have a little background with archery, not a lot, just like at a summer camp and things like that. Um, it's fun to shoot an arrow at a thing. Uh, I obviously, you know, didn't, didn't pursue it. I uh, was never good at it, but it is fun to try it out. So if you've never tried to shoot uh, a bow and arrow, Give it a shot. Ha, ah, see what I did there? All right. The next word is archetype. This is a noun from 1545. One, the original pattern or model of which all things of the same type are representations or copies. Synonym is prototype. And then we have an addendum to that defini definition. It says also a perfect example. Number two, we have the 1A definition for the word idea. 
Three, an inherited idea or mode of thought in the psychology of C.G. Jung that is derived from the experience of the race and is present in the unconscious of the individual. Archetypal uh, and archetypical are adjectives. Archetypally, hmm, there's no IC in there. Archetypally uh, and and archetypically, oh, those are hard words to say. Uh, Those are adverbs. And let's look at the etymology uh, from the Latin archetypum, from our, uh, from Greek archetypon, which is from the neutral uh, Greek archetypos or archetypos, uh, which means archetypal. Uh, and that is from archene plus typos, which means type. So there you go with archetype. There was another thing I wanted to mention about uh, no editing and I was going to say it at the end of this word, and I can't remember, so I'm going to say it later when I remember it. All right, next is archfiend, A-R-C-H-F-I-E-N-D. This is a noun from 16, 1667. It's a very S-E. Um, this is a chief fiend, especially the synonym Satan. The thing that I wanted to say about no editing was that it puts some extra pressure on me to keep on talking, to keep things interesting, um, hopefully just just keep on talking and see what comes out and accept, this is, a, this is a personal test for me, to accept that what I'm going to say is perfectly fine, either it's silly or it's terrible or whatever, uh, but it's, I'm sort of pushing my limits to just let myself go and see what happens. So, let's move on to arch foe. I'm guessing it's similar to arch fiend. This is a noun from 1595. A principal foe. Synonym is arch enemy. We must have read arch enemy before. Yep, I think we did. Who cares? Let's move on to a prefix. Arch or archy. Or it's probably arc or archy. Uh, Let's see, this means primitive, or original, or primary, as in the example archenteron, A-R-C-H-E-N-T-E-R-O-N. Now we come to a word that I am going to have trouble pronouncing, archidiaconal, archidiaconal, wow, I actually got pretty close. Uh, A-R-C-H-I-D-I-A-C-O-N-A-L, archidiaconal. This is an adjective from the 15th century of or relating to an archdeacon. Uh, Let's see, the etymology is from the Latin archidiaconus, uh, which means archdeacon. So maybe it is archidiaconal. Anyway, um, let's see. Oh, no, it is archie, because that's what the pronunciation guide says. Next is archia, archiepiscopal. Sure. This is an adjective from circa 1600 of or relating to an archbishop. I hate it that arch goes back and forth between arch and arc. It is very confusing. Uh, let's see. Archiepiscopally. Archiepiscopally. Episcopally is an adverb. See, that's the stuff that people don't like to hear. Me fumbling over words. And I don't blame them, but I'm leaving it in. The etymology says this is uh, from Middle Latin archiepiscopalis, which is from archiepiscopus, which means archbishop. And there's more at the word archbishop. Next, we have archiepiscopate. This is a noun from 1792, and it has the synonym archbishopric. Next, we have archil, A-R-C-H-I-L. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, a violet dye obtained from lichens. Uh, And the genera scientific name is, uh, there's two, it looks like. Rochella, R-O-C-C-E-L-L-A, and Lecanora. That's a very beautiful name. Uh, Number two, a lichen that yields archil. Next, we have archimandrite. A-R-C-H-I-M-A-N-D-R-I-T-E. This is a noun from 1591. A dignitary in an Eastern church ranking below a bishop. I think I said that weird. A dignitary in an Eastern church ranking below a bishop. 
specifically the superior of a large monastery or group of monasteries. Anything to say in the etymology, this is from uh, Greek archimandrites, uh, which is from the Greek prefix archi, plus mandra, which means a monastery. And that is from a Greek word that means fold or pen. And it doesn't tell me what that last Greek word is. Next we have, where did it go? Archimedes screw. Archimedes is with a capital A, and there is a uh, an apostrophe at the end of the S. So his name ends in an S, and it's his screw, so it's the possessive he owns it. Uh, where did he buy it? At the hardware store? This is a noun from 1728, a device made of a tube bent spirally around an axis or of a broad threaded screw encased by a cylinder and used to raise water. I feel like I've heard of this before, but I can't really think about what it is exactly. I, I want to look at a picture and see what this is exactly. Uh, all right, next we have archipelagic. Archipelagic, yeah. This is an adjective from 1841 of relating to or located in an archipelago, which is our next word. Archipelago, this is a noun from 1589. One, an expanse of water with many scattered islands. Two, a group of islands. Three, something resembling an archipelago, especially a group or scattering of similar things similar things that's the end of that sentence as in an archipelago of small parks within the city the etymology says this is from archipelago uh, which is either in the aegean sea or that's the name for the aegean sea it's not super clear it's from the italian archipelago spelled slightly differently which literally means chief sea and that is from the prefix archi uh, plus the greek word Pelagos, which means sea, S-E-A. And there's more at the word plagal, P-L-A-G-A-L. I don't know what that word is. Um, I think the Galapagos Islands are an archipelago, I'm assuming. Um, I should know this. I really, really want to go visit the Galapagos Islands. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to ever get a chance to do that because I think they're really limiting how many people get to go because... When people visit, they don't follow the rules, and that is one place that you really, really should follow the rules. Uh, so if you go, please follow the rules. And if you've been there and you didn't follow the rules, shame on you. But yeah, I want to go there. Next is architect. I just met an architect. Funny. Uh, this is a noun from 1563. One, a person who designs buildings and advises in their construction. Two, a person who designs and guides a plan or undertaking, as in the architect of American foreign policy. The etymology says this is from the Greek architekton, which means master builder. I think they stole that from the Lego movie. Uh, and that is from archi plus tekton, which means builder or carpenter. And there's more at the word technical. I didn't meet an architect to have them build something for me. We were just at a party, and she just happened to be a, an architect, so we talked about that. Next, we have architectonic. This sounds fascinating. This is an adjective from 1645, and I think this is going to be the last word for the episode. Sure, why not? Uh, let's see, adjective from 1645. One, of, relating to, or according with the principles of architecture. Synonym is architectural. Number two, having an organized and unified structure that suggests an architectural design. The etymology doesn't look all that interesting. Architectonically is an adverb. And that is going to be the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. I am looking to see if I can pick a word that jumps out at me. I guess Archimedes screw just sounds interesting. Um, and it is a way to raise water uh, to make it more accessible. So that's good, right? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Until next time, I am reading you the dictionary, and we are going to start with architectonics. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>